Welcome to our PEM Northern Chapter uh, CPD webinar this morning. I'm architect uh, B. Sui Yang. You can call me uh, by surname B. Okay, uh, you should notice there is a sign in code. Please uh, jot it down. And at the end of the webinar, we'll show the sign out code as well. And please find, uh, fill out the Google form with the code for the uh, CPD purpose. For your information, this webinar will also broadcast in our PAM Lawyer Chapter Facebook page. Please share with uh, your friend. However, those uh, watch from Facebook will not able to claim CBD point. A uh, friendly reminder to all participants, keep your mic muted to avoid interrupt to the webinar. Before the webinar start, I wish to thank for uh, NS Blue Scoop, Malaysia Sundaram Bahad, and Swissma Building Technology Sundaram Bahad to sponsor this webinar and presenting the topic of Designing for Fire Safety, Understanding BS F414, Bomba Enforcement for Building Facade. Since the fire incident of uh, Greenfield Tower and Caribbean State Tower a few years ago, fire safety of building facade always a hot topic for high-rise development. Uh, the recent enforcement of BS F414, fire, fire safety standard by Bomba, has introduced new requirement for external cladding system related to fire safety. Our speaker today will taking a holistic approach to break down the performance requirements and scoring under each fire classification test covering flame growth on exposed surface, flame spread on lateral surface, requirement for non combustible classification in building material, and sharing of enforced fire safety compliance for external cleaning system. The webinar will also relate to actual simulation and the setup of fire tests for non load bearing external cleaning system. This session will be presented by Ms. Wang Sok Leng and Mr. Lau Ping Heng from Blue Scoop and Swissma. Our first speaker today, Ms. Wang, obtained her master's degree in science of University Malaysia, Pahang. She has seven years of experience in the field of manufacturing and building construction. She is also an active speaker for various seminars organized by local professional bodies, such as PAM, IEM, and ISM. Our next speaker, Mr. Lau, graduated from Monash University of Australia with a bachelor degree in civil engineering in 1983. Upon graduation, he worked for over four years as a structural design engineer as well as a residence engineer in private engineering consultant firm in KL. He has providing he has over 30 years of experience in sales, marketing, product implementation, and providing technical solutions for metal roofing. He is a member of working group with Shirin in setting up Malaysia Standard. MS2523, year 2013, title method sheet roof and wall cladding test method. He was also actively involved in the development of national occupants, general field and standard for metal roofing by CRDB Malaysia. Okay, uh, we'll have a QA session after the presentation where you may raise your hand and unmute yourself to raise your question to our speaker, or if you have any question throughout the seminar. You can type your question into the chat box for discussion during the Q&A session. So uh, next, let us welcome our PAM Modern Chapter Chairman, Architect Liao Kunchun, to deliver his opening remark before the presentation starts. Over to you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Architect B. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, everybody, and a very good morning to everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah. As usual, on behalf of PAM Northern Chapter, uh, I'd like to thank the following people for making the web banner possible. Uh, educational Chairman Architect Casey Chong and our ever-efficient PAM Northern Chapter Secretariat, our hosting partner Garis PXL, and our more PAM Northern Chapter Moderator Architect B, and of course, our presenter Mr. Lo Pingheng and Ms. Huang from Blue Scope and Swissma. Least but not uh, last but not least, all of you who are attending this morning, thank you very much. Okay, let me talk a little bit about <clears throat> uh, the sort of background. Five years ago, <clears throat> on the 14th of June 2017, I woke up in the morning and turned on the news uh, on the TV as usual. 
You know, my wife always complained. I watch too much news. Um, there was a headline on a fire uh, at a block of flats, 24-story flats in West London, an area actually I'm very familiar with because I worked many years uh, in Holland Park, which is near where the flats are. Uh, initially, there was a small fire at a lower section of the building, uh, and we didn't really thought very much of it. But very, very uh, briefly, the fire actually went up the hole and engulfed the whole tower. Unfortunately, uh, and sadly, 72 people died, and many still suffer the trauma of the fire today. As, as in the view of this incident, I think the Malaysian safety authorities review the fire safety guideline on cladding and have instituted various updates uh, to prevent any similar incident like Granville in Malaysia. We architects love to make our building design unique. It's in our nature. One way of doing it is to have a building with an interesting and distinct facade. There are endless type of cladding materials for us to choose from. Before selecting appropriate materials for our design, it is our responsibility to find out how this material perform in terms of its durability, maintenance issue, fire safety performance, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, not least the cost as well. Understanding the intrinsic property of the cladding material is a vital part of the design and application process. Once we understand that it gives us the confidence to move on ahead with our design. Therefore, we really as architects need to work very closely with the industry expert like Swissma and Bluescope to develop our design, particularly relating to external cladding. There will be a lot of useful information and technique in this presentation today. Hope you all have a productive and interesting session today. Thank you very much. I it over to you, Architect B. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, next, we will pass to Ms. Wang and Mr. Lau to yep. proceed with their presentation. Yep. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Soli. So I will be presenting for the first part. So first of all, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, I believe everyone can see my screen already, right? Okay, good. So uh, for the theme for today is about the designing for the fire safety to understand more about the BSF-414 bombard enforcement towards the all the building facades, especially referring to the external wall cladding. So the topic that I'll be sharing today is the type of fire test for the external wall claddings. So before I start about the type of the fire test, let me give a very brief introduction to why fire test is so important for the external wall claddings. And I believe that all of us, we know that the fire incident is not unfamiliar in Malaysia, and in fact, we have so many, uh, we, we have some fire incident cases that are, that are cause of the fire spread on external cladings. For example, the Pupstaka'an Kuala Lumpur, which happened back in year 2016. And there was quite limited news coverage uh, on this fire incident at that time. However, based on the reporting done by My Metro TV, the fire was initiated from the welding work on the roof that sparked on the fire on the polystyrene fiber of the external cladding. Let me share with you another classic example that happened in Malaysia, and I do believe that all the audience today are also very fresh in mind regarding this fire incident. There is the KWSB building in Kaling Jaya, which happened uh, three years ago. And based on the star online reporting stated by the Deputy Director General of Fire and Rescue Departments, the fire investigation found out that the fire is actually started from the first row. Uh, but you can see over here, the fire is actually started from the first row. And it was due to the maintenance work on the building exterior. And as you can see over the screen over here, 
these are the two photos here. This is before and also the after. So the observation is the fire is not only spread uh, outwards, it also spread laterally via the external cladding. And also based on the fire and rescue departments, the external cladding actually did not meet the fire safety requirements. This is because they found out that the reason of this fire spread on the external cladding system is because it contains of the polyform materials as reported by FMT news. So with that in mind, then I would like to tell you more about the different type of the fire test that can be done in both individuals uh, building materials. For example, I think uh, the audience today also quite well known about the class of certifications, which is tested on the individual building materials. And other than that, we have another uh, fire testing for the complete external cladding system, which is also known as a full-scale test. And this BFF14 is a new test method for the external cladding system, which has been and false by Bombard recently. So I think you might wonder, since we already have the individuals uh, uh, fine tests for the building materials, then why do we need require the additional fire test of BSF414? So uh, for you to know more about it, you have to stay through the entire session and I will tell you the reason why that don't. So let's get started with the most common uh, fire requirement uh, normally asked by the people, which is the class zero or class O. And do you know that this class O will require you to test the building materials to comply with the British standard for BS 476, part six, and also the part seven? Meaning that every building materials have to comply these two tests, uh, fire tests. So uh, let's start with the BS476 Part 6. This is meant to determine the fire growth on the exposed surface. And the diagram over here is, is basically the test setup on this BS476 Part 6, where it used to measure the fire growth on the exposed surface. And there are some of uh, the original gas burner over here, where it will ignite the fire better. And the building materials which are expressed as a test specimens in the diagram over here were placed into the test out after the fire had been ignited. And this is a typical uh, test report for the pre pendant coated steel materials which have been uh, gone through the BS476 part 6 fire test. And the test result will be expressed into the Fire propagation index and also the sub indexes. So, what does this in, uh, index mean to you or represent to? I will tell you later on how does this result will able to relate to class four. Moving on to the PS476 part seven, is measure on the spread of the flame on the lateral surface. And the test specimen over here, which is the, uh, referring to the building materials will be prepared in the rectangular shape and will be located adjacent to the radiant heat. And again, the scope of this method is only to determine the surface spread of the flame and does not uh, take into account all the core materials, meaning that only the exposed surface will be tested. So once the radiant heat is ready and stabilized, then the, the sample of the test specimen will be rotated 90 degree uh, adjacent to it. And the initial fire will be ignited at the start. And what you are seeing over here is actually the one of the video posted on the YouTube by Rolling Toss Fire, where it shows the fire is being spread regularly with the help of the radiant heat. If the surface apparently facilitated such fire spread. So, to give you a better visual, the samples that you saw earlier in the uh, previous video, we have some lines on it. So, those lines is meant to provide the 
better visual judgment for evaluations. And if the building material is classified as a class one for PS476 Park 7, it means that the fire shouldn't spread beyond the red box area. So those lines is basically to give you uh, the aid or, or the visual judgment for the evaluation scores. And this is uh, the typical test report for the pre pentacotic steel materials after they have gone through BS476 Part 7. So in the report itself, um, basically the observation that we have is uh, across all the pre pentacotic steel materials, we do not observe there's any of uh, the spread of the flame over the surface. So in order for building material to be classified as a class four, these are the requirements. Meaning that the building materials must be tested according to both PS476 Park 6 and also the Park 7. And the requirements for Park 6, the fire propagation index should less than 12 units. And all the sub-indexes should less than 6 units. And then for the example that I shared earlier on, is uh, one of the test reports for the pre pentacotic stick which fall within the requirements. And for BS476 Part 7, the requirement is class 1 of the surface spread of the plane. Remember the red, red, uh, the red box the, uh, that I shared in the previous slide earlier on. <coughs> and in short, generally, all the pre printer could still is classified as a class four. But please bear in mind that please always to get this clarified when you look for any other building materials. Try to seek the clarification from all the material suppliers whether uh, the material is classified to class four. So coming to the question, why we still require the uh, to have additional fire tests of BSF 414 since we already have class all specifications which cover the BS 476 Part 6 and Part 7. Because the scope of BS 476 and also Part 6 and also Part 7, it will only cover or uh, it will only test up on the uh, the building material that is exposed to the external. Or uh, let me give you an example. If the material itself is a panel, which it six of three building uh, materials come uh, to a finished uh, panels. If they go for uh, BS476 Part 6 and also Part 7 fire test, only the building material one will be tested under the scope. However, for the building material two and three, it's not able to be tested under the scope of BS476 and Part 6 and also Part 7 because it is already shielded by the building material one. So there's a reason why Omba had uh, recently uh, enforced the additional bio test for the external cladding system, which uh, will be more holistic to, uh, to test on the full scale system of the external cladding. Then the next question, how about combustibility tests? Most often, I do hear that the reference of class all to non combustible materials. But in fact, there is a difference. So over here, you can see that the combustibility test is actually referred to BS476 Part 4. And this is how the test specimens will be prepared for combustibility tests. But the test specimen will require to be prepared in 40 to uh, time 40 in the square uh, shape with 15 uh, uh, millimeter height. And it requires to drill 25 uh, millimeter depth because it requires to insert the thermal compass inside the test specimen level. And this is how the test setup will look like for the combustibility test. First of all, the furnace will require to heat up until 750 degrees C and stabilize to maintain the temperature at 750 degrees C. Then the test specimen will only place inside the furnace. 
and there are two thermocouples uh, will be used for this combustibility test. One is inside the furnace, another one is inside the test specific so, so in order for the for the building materials to be classified as a non-combustible, the first two criteria are both measure the are the measure temperature in the test specific and the adjacent uh, to the expense will not exceed 50 degrees Celsius from the initial stabilized temperature of 750 degrees Celsius, which also means that the, the temperature reading that measured by thermocouple shouldn't exceed 800 degrees C. Another criteria is that it shouldn't be any visible flame within the furnace area that lasts more than 10 seconds. So if there's any flaming, flaming or there's any uh, visible flame has been observed that and lasts for 10 seconds, then it fails the criteria. And this is uh, the one of the test report called unpainted coated steel materials. So normally in the test report itself, it would mention whether the, uh, the test specimens is combustible or non combustible. So, over here, this is the test report for unpainted coated steel material. So, we can conclude that uh, for unpainted coated steel materials, we'll be able to classify as non combustible materials. And please bear in mind that you always see the clarifications for the material supplies regarding the combustibility test. Next part is about the BSF-014, the, uh, the main topic that will be sh uh, sharing for today's. This BSF-014 is the new uh, fire test to be introduced for external cleaning system. And this test was introduced after the major incidents of KWSP building. So to give you a clearer perspective, this is how the Beard F414 fire test would look like. This is exactly the photos that I, I shoot when I had I got the chance to witness the Beard F414 fire test. The reason for this test to be enforced is actually they want to ensure that the complete external cleaning system had been put to this uh, virus test and passed all the criteria before it had been used in the actual building. This also includes the cavity spaces, which I think in the previous individual building materials, uh, the cavity person is not in the uh, considerations. Because with the cavity spaces, and if the fire, and this cavity space is exposed to the fire, it could potentially draw the fire outwards. And let me share it with you about the fire spread mechanism. But first of all, the fire it can be initiated either from internal or external. Just like the Buxan KL or KWSP buildings. Then if the fire is allowed to break out the windows, meaning that the fire from internal is allowed to break out the windows, then uh, the flame can be typically extended to two meters above the top of the openings, meaning that it can be uh, spread widely or outwards. And if there is any interaction or uh, interior fire with, with the exterior fire, then it will definitely accelerate the fire spread to move outward or laterally. And once the fire is having moved outwards, it can re-enter back to the building. It means that it will be able to spread the fire break into the next level of the building as well. And what if the external cladding, it, it allows the fire to spread via the external cladding surface or even the cavity spaces, then it will definitely assist the fire to spread even more, even gradually outwards or laterally, uh, which it will create another inferno. And the fire fighting will be more difficult 
if the external cladding system is contributing to the fire propagation rate. And for this BFF14 fire test, it's going to test on the non load bearing external cladding system, meaning that those external cladding system would be uh, expected to be blocked either onto the nursery wall or the mount steel structures. And for BSF14 is divided into two parts, the part one and part two. So part one is mainly referring to the test setup that is uh, installed uh, onto the maxillary wall. And then for the part two, it's referring to the external cladding system that is locked onto the mount steel structures. And why BSF-114 is considered a full-scale test? Because the test result is unique to the overall build of the system itself. Because the spread of fire is uh, dependent on multiple factors. For example, the all type of the materials in the external cladding system itself, and how does it interact during the fire. It also uh, cover up the panel orientations, whether uh, is it installed uh, vertically or horizontally, and is there any uh, cavity space, uh, how that is the cavity space, and etc. It also in, uh, including the type of insulation that you use or whether grooming membrane they use for the external cladding system. Means that all these uh, items will be tested under the PSM form. And this is the BSS414 uh, test that I would look like. Uh, either you are going for the test uh, for part one or part two. The final layout is very, very similar, whereby you will be having the main face and also the main space. And there's one combustion chamber at the bottom of the main space. It's basically to simulate that the fire is coming out from the window. And as you can see over the diagram here, the height of the test setup is more than as this is for the fire test, then the thermocouples is very important and to, it is used in order to measure the temperature at the different part of the cladding. So over here, you will be able to see that, that the thermocouples are placed at the two different levels. The level one is 2.5 meter above the combustion chamber. The level two is 5 meter about the commercial chamber. And for this test method, it used works as a fuel source for measuring the fire performance of the cladding system. For example, the temperature measurements, the visual observation of the burning, visual observation of the falling debris. And the TS, the small letter T, S is a time when the temperature measured at the level one increased to 200 degrees Celsius for more than 30 seconds, then the tester will start to evaluate the materials. <laughs> the thermocouples are not only placed at a different level, it also placed in a different section of the cladding to make sure that the internal temperature rise is measured as well. So the thermocouples can be categorized as internal thermocouples and external thermocouples. So if the component of the cavity space in the external cladding system itself is more than 10 millimeter in thickness, then the thermocouples will be placed in the middle of that component of cavity. This is the example for the internal uh, thermocouples. And then for external thermocouples, normally you will be able to see it from the exterior. And this is uh, uh, how the external thermocouples uh, seen from the external surface. Then the next question will be, when does we require for this BFF for one test? Is it required for all types of the buildings? Or is this only limited to certain uh, criteria or certain requirements? So the directive for the OMPA, the BSF for one for will be required for all the external work with the building height is more than 80 meters on the ground. Then, how about for those buildings that is uh, below 80 meter height? Should it 
uh, also good for be a carbon bomb or there's another uh, biotech. So the directive for Bomba is for any building that is lower than 80 meters high, the, the building materials would require to go for class of classifications, which refer to the BS476 Part 6 and Part 7 Biotech. <coughs> Then next, how do we know whether, uh, how does those uh, external cladding uh, system is considered pass or fail or BS414? So here are the criteria. And these criteria are core developed between Bomba and also Cecilia. So in total, there are six criteria together will determine whether the specific external cladding system is able to pass the uh, to able to pass and to be used as a as a cladding. So let's see how these criteria are evaluated. So the first criteria is about the external fire spray, and it will be measured based on the level two external thermocouples. Meaning using this or these thermocouples. And in order for the cladding to pass, the external surface should not allow the fire spread coming from the combustion chamber, which is simulating the fire coming out from the window. So to be more precise, all the external thermal couples at level two should not have a continuous temperature reading of more than 600 degrees C for 30 seconds, within the 50 minutes from the start time. The small, uh, small letter T S. And the second criteria is internal fire spread. So the criteria is pretty similar with the, uh, the first criteria, but for the second criteria is mainly on internal fire spread. So it is also measured based on the level two internal thermocouples, as shown this figure here. And in order for the cladding to pass, then the internal thermal uh, uh, the internal thermocouples at the level two should not have the continuous reading of more than 600 degrees C for 30 seconds within the within the rest of the It's pretty similar with the first criteria. And for the third criteria, it's all about the visible flame. And this evaluation will be based on the visual. If there's any fire is seen exceeding the confined space of the textile, either laterally, as what you can see uh, over the diagram here, meaning that it's already exceeded the confined space. So if this happened and the, uh, the continuous flame is observed, more than 60 seconds, then it will fail this criteria. It is not the visible flame is not only a uh, uh, control uh, wire, whether it's only spread laterally, it is also uh, to be controlled uh, whether the fire is spread uh, upwards, meaning that is there any uh, visible flame uh, observed on top of the test so similarly, if there's any uh, continuous flame is observed for continuous 60 seconds, then it will fail this criteria. And the reason why the fire uh, were able to spread upwards, it could be uh, due to the, the cavity spaces. This could be one of the uh, of the root cause because if this is likely to happen if the fire is not developed within the activity spaces. And then for the next two criteria, then it will be confined to the collapse zones. Like what you can see over the diagram here, the, the blue rectangular shape over here, where the confined uh, collapse zone is defined with 2.4 meter width and 1.2 meter depth in front of the combustion chambers. Because for, for the intense fire uh, use of BSF-104, there is the possibility that 
the panel's locking mechanism might be affected. That is the reason why we have uh, the mechanical performance, basically to evaluate uh, how does it uh, perform when it is exposed to the fire, because of the intense fire. So for the fourth criteria, there should not be any component of the cladding that is longer than 500 uh, milliliter in length and 200 gram in weight. The mini set of object shouldn't fall outside the confined space. Otherwise, it will create the roadside safety or even affect the firefighter effectiveness in putting off the fires. So if there's anything, uh, any object to be found that is fall outside the collection within the 60 minutes of the time stop of the test stop, then it will fill this schedule. And except for the mechanical performance, there should not be any burning debris or profile developed outside the collection as well. This is uh, especially dangerous if there is any combustible materials adjacent to the building. And also, it will create the fire intervention for firefighter to perform the job. So, if there is any uh, burning debris or pool fire that lasts for 60 seconds and develop outside the collapse zone within the 60 minutes of the test stop, then it will fail this criteria. And lastly, the criteria of the fire burn through, this is only relevant to the external cladding that is locked onto the mouth steel structures, which also means that it's only applicable to BS at 414 part two only. It's not applicable to part one that is uh, installed uh, on the masonry wall. So the failure will occur if the continuous flaming uh, at the internal surface, meaning that we are able to see the fire is actually burned through the external cladding system. And if the, this flaming is, uh, <coughs> is visible and, main, and maintained for more than 60 seconds, then and above 0 0.5 meter height above the combustion chamber, then it will consider fail this criteria. The reason behind this criteria is to ensure that the cladding will not give back to the fire so that whoever or whatever that is located behind the external cladding will not be exposed to the risk of fire exposure. This is the main reason why these uh, fire burn through requirements have been introduced and have become uh, the part of the criteria for uh, BSF or part two. So the sixth performance criteria above has brought my sharing to the end. So if you have any uh, questions, please feel free to drop the questions in the Q&A box or even the chat box. Then we will be answering the question at the last uh, session of this webinar. And now I would like to pass the floor to the next speaker. It's allowed to share with you on the correlation of the system cost and also the compliance of fire safety for the state of sun. Yeah, Ms. Salah, hand over to you. Yes, uh, good morning and uh, salam sejahtera everyone. Well, Shaling, that was a very good sharing and uh, very insightful presentations. I'm sure the audience will now uh, understand what is class O rating about and also the limitation for the uh, class O rating, right? Because it doesn't fully access a uh, composite system. And you have also explained to the audience what are the criteria for this uh, uh, BS8414. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to share with you the test results that uh, we have taken. Uh, give me a second. I will just share my... Uh, Presentation. Sorry. OK. 
Okay, right. So, so understanding BSA four one four, that was the that's the focal point of this morning's uh, uh, sessions. So, on my side, uh, I have five things to share here. First, uh, I'll be taking you through. Um, sorry, I need to unshare and put on the video. Uh. Stop share. Can't see my screen, right? Let me do again. Sorry for the technical hitch. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, Mr. Lee. Sorry for the technical glitch just now. So, like I said, um, I'll be sharing uh, actual tests done for the 8414 as the first part of my sharing. Then, um, give you a little bit of uh, insight into what caused the fire for the Grenfell Tower. And I'll be touching on the uh, legal consequences when external cladding catches fire, and also, we'll be also sharing the alternative design of external cladding using coated steel, and I'll end up uh, the summary of my presentation. First, the sharing of a Satya City Mall uh, BS8414 test. This is Satya City Mall in uh, Satya Alam, Shah Alam. Uh, this mall was constructed in uh, 2012, and in 2019, uh, there was an uh, upgrading and expansion work. And uh, it, during the expansion and upgrading work, the entire mall is uh, been cladded with this trapezoidal facade cladding in coated steel. This mall is uh, the largest uh, shopping mall in Shah Alam. And it also is the first mall that has won a uh, silver, GBI silver award. So this is another elevation for the uh, Satya Mall. A close up look at the elevation. So you can see uh, the facades are uh, installed using trapezoidal uh, cladding. Uh, there's a lap line you can see there. And another elevation. So in other words, the entire mall is now encapsulated with a trapezoidal uh, coated steel uh, cladding. And this is the first mall and the first commercial building to be tested under this BS8414 requirement. There are three tests uh, carried out for this mall. Uh, reason is uh, the bomba will require you to do a test for a different kind of uh, system or uh, mounting system especially. <clears throat> Test number one is uh, carried out under the BSA 414 part two, uh, which is over a drywall system. I'll be taking you through the test results for this uh, uh, first test because part two uh, covers six criteria that you need to pass, whereas the part one uh, covers five criteria. So test number two is on the part one, which is uh, over a masonry wall system. And in this uh, photo, you can see that the, uh, the um, transom have been installed, all these uh, structures, uh, the subframe structures that is mounted onto the brick wall and uh, on the actual side is over the uh, concrete uh, structures. So test number three is again on the over a masonry wall. The masonry wall are the existing uh, building uh, that was constructed in 2012. So in this case, the structures were uh, orientated vertically as a Malian. 
the main mainframe structures. And uh, because the trapezoidal cladding is installed with the ribs running vertical, hence you need to provide uh, horizontal uh, elements or support to secure this uh, cladding. I will show you the blown up details. So here it is. Um, the main channel supports is uh, mounted vertically and uh, we added this uh, top head to secure this uh, external cladding. So because of the orientations of the structure that is different, uh, Bomba requires a different test, despite being the same cavity and being the same uh, uh, system over a masonry wall. So that will give you an idea what Bomba is looking for because the fire propagation uh, effect, I believe, uh, could be different if your structure is mounted uh, horizontally or vertically. So this is a test report. <clears throat> so this is the uh, front page and here they capture the applicant name. In this case, uh, this is the main contractor for the project. And um, here is referred to BS8414 part two. And they describe the test method here and the description of test specimen. So the test specimen consists of Swiss Mar Sanko speed deck metal wall cladding in clean carbon XRW steel with SP fire stop and drywall system. So in this test, uh, there was this fire stop incorporated into the uh, assembly. I will show you where uh, it's located later on. So you can see this uh, test was conducted in September 2019. So it's uh, the same one, the first test that was carried out in this uh, laboratory uh, set up by Siri. So that is the launching date actually. Uh, so 26 August. When you do uh, submissions to uh, for to carry out the test, you need to provide very detailed uh, drawings for the uh, serum to capture. So I just uh, show here one of the uh, shop drawings uh, submitted. Here, the cross section uh, is very uh, detailed information. Uh, the dimensions are shown, the spacing of the uh, uh, structures, right? In this case, uh, is the uh, transom or the horizontal structure space at uh, 1.1 meter. So here is the fire stop. The fire stop is located directly above the uh, combustion chamber and supported by uh, flashing. Here is the location of drywall. So everything is uh, captured and uh, the construction drawing also will capture how you actually mount your structure onto the uh, system. Here again, the, they will spare up what's the cavity depth that uh, the system uh, was designed for. In this case, it's a 260 millimeter ventilated cavity. So the measurement is from the back face of the corrugated metal cladding to the front face of the drywall. So they are very specific in uh, uh, telling you how they measure those, uh, take those measurements. Here again, the next item captured is the horizontal fire stop. So here, the size of the fire stop and uh, where it was fixed, uh, horizontal edge of combustion chamber, everything is fully described and supported by illustration uh, in the shop drawings. The external finish uh, material here is 0.4, actually uh, 0.42 mm BST. Uh, they call it corrugated metal cladding, uh, but in bracket, the product was uh, clearly uh, spared up. It's a Swiss Mar Sanko speed deck, metal wall cladding in clean carbon XRW steel. So it's a trapezoidal uh, coated steel uh, facade cladding system. Here, the test specimen, the standards also uh, spell up exactly uh, to what size and uh, how you should construct it over the test rig. So it's very precise. <clears throat> they even tell you where you should do your lapping and so forth. So this one, uh, I will not go in detailed explanations. Uh, just suffice to say that whatever you do in your setup is actually uh, clearly described in the standards. 
So this is the uh, 8414 part two, like what Shopping say is uh, over a structure. It's not a masonry wall. A close up look of the uh, structure, the system that uh, was adopted for this uh, facade cladding. So you can see the bolts, the, the lip channels and everything else is constructed exactly as per construction drawing. So you can't do a makeshift structure or, or subframe just to do the test. It has to be actual. Here, because it's a dry wall and it's insulated, um, these are photos actually, these are photos uh, extracted from the report. So they actually captured what is in the system. They have this uh, wool insulation. And this is the inside of the drywall, which is using this uh, gypsum board. And the external side of the drywall is a uh, cement board, right? So it's all captured. And if you have any uh, system to support or to close any gaps, it will be clearly indicated in the report as well. In other words, you're supposed to do that on site as per submission. Well, this uh, actual photo of this uh, uh, fire stop is a rock pool placed uh, directly above this combustion chamber. Uh, there's a flashing uh, below that as well, and it's also supported by uh, another uh, system. So then you we install the flashings around the uh, test rig. Thereafter, uh, the cladding was installed and it's ready for the test. This is the test uh, at 10 minutes after ignition, and the, the other one is at 20 minutes. So you can see the fire is uh, very ferocious. And uh, later on, you can see, I'll show you, this is uh, after 30 minutes of the continuous uh, burning. So, <laughs> Oh, we can hear the video. Nothing much, but this uh, hear the sounds of the fire burning. So after thirty minutes, if the fire has been uh, kind of subsided or subsiding, because you can see that at the peak, the fire has gone to this level, and uh, level two is somewhere here about five meter above the combustion chamber, top of the combustion chamber. So this, uh, uh, later on, I will tell you uh, how the criteria are accessed. Now the test results. So the first two criteria as explained by uh, Shockling is about <clears throat> the uh, temperature reading at level two. So they planted thermocouple at the external surface uh, in this drywall, they planted it at the external surface. They planted in the cavity. They also planted one inside the uh, drywall system. So all these uh, criteria is to measure the fire spread. And the way they uh, measure this is by taking the temperature reading at level two. So this is within 15 minutes from start time. Now, what is start time TS, the small TS? And in this report, it's recorded as 8 minutes, 12 seconds after ignition of the creep. Uh, they set the fire here at the combustion chamber. And uh, you, you must have a, what they call this, consistency, right, to do your assessment and measurement for such tests. So the way they established that uh, benchmark consistency is when level one achieved two, 200 degrees Celsius, that's where the start time takes. So at eight minutes, 12 seconds after the ignition, level two registered 200 degrees Celsius. And when that happens, there's a green light that uh, been uh, triggered. And then the start time of the 15 minutes uh, will take place. So in this uh, test, the peak temperature uh, recorded was 532.6 degrees Celsius, and that was uh, 
achieved at 10 minutes 33 seconds after TS, right? And the cavity temperature was lower, 303. And when you go into the uh, thermocouple, inside the drywall is very much lower uh, as expected. So, so this will give you a clear picture how these uh, measurements are done. Okay, they have a benchmark based on the start time TS. So this is a thermograph. The temperatures are recorded uh, in, the, in the test uh, lab. So here is level one external thermocouple, which is 2.5 meters above the combustion chamber. So the highest temperature recorded hits about 900 degrees Celsius at level one. Okay, level one is here. Okay, it's 2.5 meter above the combustion chamber. So whereas level two, where the temperature is the one that triggers the uh, criteria, is recorded at 532, as uh, I read out just now. So, so you can see that all these um, time timeline, this uh, this uh, horizontal is the time, and the vertical is the temperature. So you can see that uh, the intensity of the heat or the temperature rises and subside. This is that uh, level two cavity uh, thermocouple, which is actually uh, in the cavity. This is in the cavity of the drywall. So here, the test report uh, stated very clearly external fire spread and internal fire spread uh, within the 15 minutes, uh, all three pass. So the third criteria is the visible flaming. Uh, so visible flaming uh, is actually on the lateral and the vertical uh, assessment. The flames, uh, just to recap, cannot uh, exceed the confine of this test rig, either uh, horizontally or vertically. So there is also a criteria spell out that is 60 seconds of fire that uh, uh, extend out of the perimeter and not just uh, intermittent fire. Intermittent fire that's not sustainable is uh, considered acceptable. So for this test, uh, again, uh, within, they will observe six, within 60 minutes. Uh, so not, in order not to confuse, the entire test uh, for the fire intensity that I would like to call it is within that 15 minutes because the temperature measurement is within the 15 minutes. Thereafter, they will put out the fire, but the, the whole test rig will be uh, left there for 60 minutes. Uh, later on, I'll explain why it's also left there for 60 minutes. But in this case, uh, the flaming uh, it passed. And here, the fourth criteria, the mechanical performance. This is where I think the 60 minutes uh, counts. Even after you have put up the fire, put off the fire, uh, the measurements for any uh, fallouts of uh, structure or mechanical performance assessment uh, will take place. So here again, uh, ex explained by Shockling, the any object falling out has to be outside the collapse zone. Anything within, I believe, based on the interpretation, is deemed acceptable. So it has a fallout of this collapse zone. And they are so specific that they even tell you minimally what's the length and what's the weight. So it's not every uh, single object that falls out will fail the test, right? It has to have an object significant in weight or size. And that again, falling out of the collapse zone. In our case, there was nothing falling outside the collapse zone. So uh, it was passed. The fifth criteria is burning debris and pool fires. So here again is uh, talking about anything, pool fires and uh, debris that is falling outside the collapse zone. And that flame has to be sustained for 60 seconds at least. So for that, uh, we pass. And uh, this video will kind of explain why this uh, assessment is so important because in any fire, 
there will be pool fires that is uh, falling off and there will be debris that is uh, of high heat intensity falling off from the high, higher uh, level. So this will be very detrimental for rescue work and also it will spread fires uh, downward and uh, throughout uh, the external part of the building. So the fifth criteria uh, we passed, uh, there was no uh, burning uh, debris at all. And the sixth criteria is only applied to part two. And in this case, we have a drywall system and the uh, assessment is whether the fire burned through your uh, drywall system. So here they are very specific about where they measure your temperature or your uh, inspection. So again, everything is spelled out uh, in the standard. How long, 60 seconds, where do they measure, and uh, at what timing that the uh, measurement was taken. So everything is spelled out, so it's not subjective. It's actually based on what is written in the standards. So in our case, uh, that one was uh, not, not an issue, so we passed. So this is the after conditions of the test specimen. So the outer surface, when the fire is put out in here, actually uh, they already removed the, the charcoals or the, the burnt wood. So you can see that this is where the fire, uh, intense, the heat intensity was. And uh, once the cladding is removed, you can see that the cement board uh, is scorched, right? It didn't burn just at this high intensity area, it got scorched. And uh, the fire stop uh, was actually uh, not damaged at all. And you can see that there's a, just a hairline crack on this uh, external cement board. And so uh, on a close-up look after the test, you can see that uh, another shot closer. So this is a flashing above the combustion chamber and can see that the paints have been burned at some area and the blistering of the paint in other areas. The screws, the self-tapping screws are still intact. Uh, it could be just burned. It didn't uh, fall off or rupture. So this is before and that's after. So meaning to say this uh, trapeze oil coated steel uh, cladding system, uh, our Sanko speed deck in color bond, uh, even at 0.42 mm BST thickness, uh, could withstand the BSA414 test without any problem at all. In fact, even the physical damage of the product is uh, very, very uh, uh, limited, right? You can see it's only uh, some pain being burned off and uh, blistering of the uh, pain. And in some area, because of the intensity, uh, some of the flashings or could get distorted and that's for it. So that so much for the sharing, and I hope with that sharing you can relate uh, what the the criteria are and what happens on the actual test. So next, uh, uh, the sharing of this grant file uh, for those who are needs more information or interested, you can go to YouTube and uh, there's a public inquiry ongoing. It's still ongoing on uh, this project despite the fire uh, incident. Uh, took place in 2017. So uh, a video clip to explain uh, what, how this, uh, what caused the fire. The blaze started in flat 16 on the fourth floor of the east elevation. It rapidly spread through the window. The first image of the flames taking hold outside flat 16 was taken at 1.09 a.m. It took just a few minutes for the fire to spread up 19 storeys to the top of the building. While the fire was spreading upwards, it was also spreading horizontally at a tremendous rate and in opposite directions until all four elevations of the building were engulfed in flames. The flames met at levels 22 and 23, near the southeast corner of the building. 
In total, 98 flats were exposed to the flames. 72 people lost their lives in the tragedy. Yeah, so this uh, was a very tragic uh, fire. I think uh, Mr. Liao uh, watched the video, uh, I'm sure. And um, now I will take you through another video that explains why the fire was so catastrophic and what causes the uh, fiery disaster. The report identified the cladding as the primary cause of the fire spreading up the outside of the building. Tests showed the cladding materials didn't comply with the recommended fire performance for a building of that height. It also claimed the key players involved in the 2016 refurbishment of the tower hadn't found out how the new cladding system would behave in a fire. So the cause of the um, fire is uh, obviously uh, from the cladding. And I can see that the cladding material was kind of combustible, right? That's why uh, the um, fire actually, uh, uh, what do you call this, spread so uh, fiercely across the building, laterally and uh, vertically. You can see the timing of these uh, snapshots. This is 1.30 a.m. and this is 2.34, so within an hour you can see how the fire break up and then it spread within an hour, how much it has spread and uh, 3.44, right, this is just two hours later, the, the entire building is really engulfed uh, with fire. So, so it's very fast and uh, very serious and that's why because it, it, the fire broke out at 1.30 a.m. in the morning and uh, very unfortunate at the time, those who are at home were sleeping. So there were 72 deaths in this uh, fire, very unfortunate. Um, so this is uh, showing the uh, rescue being done and uh, it was quite fast, right? 1.30 by 5.16, you can say the fire already doused uh, by the fire brigade. So this is a short video clip extracted uh, this is the uh, part of the investigation on the public inquiry. And there was this Professor Luke Bisbee that conducted this uh, independent test on the assembly for that Grenfell Tower. So I'll just share this uh, video. You can hear the crackling noise and all that. It's because I, if you can uh, pay attention behind this area, this cavity area, that, that where the temperature intensity is very high, um, based on our test, it went to close to 900 degrees Celsius. So this is a uh, aluminum ACP uh, panels. <clears throat> so meaning to say any material that is uh, having a melting point below 900 degrees Celsius, would have melted and uh, that's what happened here because the ACP panel here if you look carefully through the fire the panel uh, the aluminum has melted away and that's why you see pools uh, pool of fires down there and uh, you just uh, pay attention to this area here You can see it's already burned through here.
car. The test was stopped uh, because it really failed the test at that point. So, so uh, just imagine uh, that is a full uh, is of course a full scale test in the test rig. That's only a two point four meter by uh, eight meter high with the two one point two meter wing side. That small area you can see the the intensity of the fire uh, within the short period. So when you have a facade cladding on a high rise, the fire will spread through your cavity and also due to combustibility of the material, it will add fuel to the fire because anything combustible will kind of uh, be acting like a fuel to the fire. So, so it's very rapid. And in the Grenfell, uh, because in those cold countries, they have the insulated uh, uh, facade cladding. Unfortunately, they, the insulation they use is also combustible. They use this PIR, so it was also combustible. So that's why the fire uh, was spreading even more rapidly than uh, the, without the insulation, without the combustible insulation. Now, a lot of people will be uh, thinking that, okay, are very unfortunate, we're very sad that there's fire uh, facade on, on facade cladding in uh, England or back home in Malaysia. Uh, the EPF building or the KWSP. Unfortunately, there was no casualty. Then um, we just take it as an incident and then uh, we move forward. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> as a consultant, as an architect, as any uh, professional that is involved in the uh, design of a building and uh, have a say in the choice of facade cladding, uh, need to pay attention to these legal consequences uh, when external cladding catches fire. This is a, another unfortunate project down in Australia, the La Crosse Tower. Uh, this fire took place in uh, November 24, 2014. So just a simulation of a fire. You can see that at level 10, <clears throat> the fire broke up. And that fire spreads vertically. It didn't spread as much uh, horizontally or laterally. But within 10 minutes, right? Within 10 minutes, the fire spread from level 10 to level 21. So that is how rapidly the fire uh, can spread. So it's very scary. Uh, by the time the fire brigade comes, to rescue, I think it's really kind of a too late. And in this project, the La Crosse Tower uh, residents, the apartment tower residents, uh, this is the news extracted from the National Victoria Infrastructure uh, publication. The apartment tower residents awarded millions in damages after cladding fire. So here, <clears throat> while, while nobody died in the blaze, the towers sent shock waves through the nation's construction industry and sparked concerns about cladding across the city. I think it's, it doesn't even uh, just send shock waves in Australia. I think it's sending shock waves uh, throughout the world, <clears throat> especially to countries, uh, Commonwealth countries uh, like Malaysia, because um, the case uh, already come to a conclusion. And the uh, judge finds the architect proportionally liable for the lacrosse fire damages. So this is a landmark decision. So because this is a Commonwealth country uh, where precedent case, uh, precedent case uh, is a very important uh, evidence to argue in any case. So here, this case is on a very clear facade cladding fire. And in fact, this fire, this fire was caused by a smoker, just to give you a bit of a, a story behind it. It was caused by a smoker at the fourth floor. He threw his unextinguished, uh, unextinguished cigarette butt into a bin, and the bin caught fire, and uh, hence the rest is history, right? From there, just the fire on the bin uh, caused the uh, entire facade cladding uh, to be uh, 
a blaze and uh, causes all the damages. Fortunately, um, no casualty or, or fatality in this fire. So what happened is since the judge has uh, made his uh, decision, then there will be a award for damage, right? So now let's look at who are those uh, responsible to compensate or to pay for the damage for the fire. So here you can see that uh, there are four parties uh, liable for the damage. The total damage uh, awarded was Australian 5.7 million. And uh, listed here, the four parties, the building surveyor in Australia, the architects, the fire engineer in Australia, they have fire engineer and uh, the smoker, right? The, the person or the culprit that caused the fire. So these are the percentage of award. So in normal circumstances, uh, of course, the one who started the fire would shoulder the biggest part of respons responsibility, uh, wouldn't he? Because without him causing the fire, there will be no damage and no uh, fire incident. So this, the judge makes a decision that is very uh, interesting. And I'd like to share this with you. Maybe before I share who is paying for this uh, proportion, maybe you go through your mind and uh, figure out, okay, you have been architects. How liable are you in this uh, incident? Are you uh, the least liable or are you the most liable? And what about a smoker? Would a smoker be most liable because he causes the fire? So in Malaysia, uh, we have buildings over here, but I think when it comes to specification, uh, it's a lot done by the quantity surveyors. We have architects. We don't have fire engineer. Uh, so I think here, I, I'm not sure. Uh, in Malaysia, we have a facade cladding consultant. Uh, so maybe the role play and the consultant involvement in Malaysia is uh, different uh, from what is in Australia. But anyway, uh, if you have uh, sort of uh, figure out where you fit in as an architect, now let me uh, show you the results. So 33% is uh, the building surveyor and the architects is 25%, right? They have to foot one quarter of the uh, damage cost and the fire engineer is most liable because I think as the name imply they are fire engineers so so their duty is to make sure that everything is fire safe and the guy who caused the fire still can't get away but with only three uh, percent of the cost uh, sharing this project is actually uh, I have another interesting point to share is because the uh, original uh, product specified was a fire rated uh, material. Uh, I don't want to put the brand. It was fire rated. But the main contractor, you can see the main contractor uh, is not even uh, guilty of anything. And uh, the main contractor is the one that changed the fire rated panel to non fire rated. See? And he gets away. He also played a role in causing the fire because it changed. Fire rated to non fire rated, but in according to law, he exercised and he worked within the contract uh, contractual obligations. He submitted, uh, done the paperwork, I suppose, he submitted the samples and the paperwork to the architect to tell the architect, hey, I, I want to have a, propose, I have a proposal here. I'm not sure whether there's any cost saving passed on to the owner or whoever, but in the nutshell, he proposed a non-fire rated, similar brand, and the architects approved, right? So the architects also argue in the case that he approves a sample based on aesthetic and not based on performance, and the judge didn't buy that. So that, that sharing is very important because you could have done the correct specification in your projects, but you need to also be careful if there's any changes to what you have specified, you need to know. And uh, you need to, again, make a decision based on what uh, knowledge you have. So taking uh, alternative proposals uh, to, to approve, you need to be careful again because 
the architect specified correctly. I'm not sure saying that the correct specs would not cause a fire, but maybe not not uh, not so, or maybe not so serious. I'm not sure. All right. So so that is uh, the cross uh, for you to know. So uh, lastly, I'll be sharing uh, alternative uh, external cladding systems using coated steel. So in the market, especially in Malaysia, uh, what we see for uh, this non-load bearing external cladding or the facade cladding is always predominantly, I would say predominantly is uh, uh, using this ACP, right? The uh, aluminum composite cladding is very nice. It's very uh, modern. And that's why I think uh, most architects or designer uh, choose that kind of material. I'm not sure, right? But that is in Malaysia. What about in other countries? So here, I, I, I'm just sharing, this is just a normal trapezoidal or the corrugated profile uh, that you see in the market. Uh, so can this be used for, uh, for sub cladding? The answer is certainly yes. So you can see here in Australia, especially in countries like Australia or even America, I believe, uh, in certain part of Europe, you can see that they actually use uh, external uh, trapezoidal deck as external facade cladding, like here. And uh, here as well, this is using the corrugated uh, profile. And this is the corrugated profile again. Uh, laid uh, horizontally or at an oblique angle. And uh, back home in Malaysia, <clears throat> this is uh, the Mercedes-Benz showroom uh, because it's, uh, like I said, in country like Germany, in Europe, they love to have this uh, corrugated uh, profile as a cladding, whether exterior or internal. So here, the showroom uh, for this Mercedes-Benz is using the corrugated uh, metal cladding. Uh, we supplied that in our Swissman sinusoidal uh, in uh, colorborn steel. The Satir City Convention Center 2 is also uh, cladding done uh, using this trapezoidal, the sample speed deck colorborn steel, right? Interplay with a lot of vibrant color. So this, this could have been a ACP panels uh, as a choice, for example. But uh, instead, it's done using this uh, trapezoidal uh, cladding. Just like the Satir City uh, Mall, it's the first um, major mall that is entirely uh, covered as a facade using a trapezoidal facade cladding. So it's very nice. Uh, and because the material uh, performance is also uh, very good because you've got all the warranty against uh, color fading and uh, perforation against a uh, lot of uh, even anti-dirt issues. So, so it can be uh, options for facade cladding. Then again, uh, uh, moving away from trapezoidal uh, profile, what do we have? We can actually opt to have this kind of uh, metal tiles uh, profile. Here, there are three metal tiles that I'm sharing, which is also offered by us. That's a diamond shape, and that's a rectangular or brick, brick lay pattern when you install it. And then you have the rhomboid. So to install that facade cladding, uh, metal tiles cladding is quite straightforward. Again, uh, over a masonry wall or over any drywall or structure, uh, all you need is a uh, support layer, which is the trapezoidal deck, and then you secure these uh, metal tiles over this uh, trapezoidal deck. So in this uh, project in Turkey, they have a different uh, tiles uh, design, but just to highlight that is a metal tiles uh, cladding. So even our office, uh, we chose to have these metal tiles in diamond shape. Right, so you can see it, it actually provides a very refreshing and very um, classy look to the facade. A simple uh, single story office using colorborn steel. So that's another uh, project in Germany. Here they choose to have the uh, brick lay patterns as a uh, design. And this is the Prime Minister's uh, residence in Putrajaya. 
so you could be wondering why am I showing you a roof? Because this roof, uh, which is done in the rhomboid pattern, can also be used as a wall. So you can see from this uh, photo that this rhomboid shape uh, is undulating, right? From where you see now, the roof is moving up and down, dancing and undulating. Uh, this is purely an optical illusion. So can you imagine having this as a uh, system? You give you some kind of a 3D effect on the wall or on the roof. So it's very interesting, something uh, different to look at. So standing seam profile, this again uh, is a very nice, uh, most versatile profile for roofing, right? It can be tapered and curved and is installed using concealed sliding clips and all that. So you don't see any screws. Uh, likewise, the metal tiles also will be all concealed fixed. You don't see screws, exposed screws. So, so this uh, standing seam is actually a very uh, a good alternative for facade cladding. Like here, right? This is done on the oblique uh, manner. So all these lines are lap line, right? It can be uh, overlap. And one of the big advantage of the standing seam is, as you can see from this building, if you have a circular uh, building, it can uh, go around the building seamlessly, like you can see here, because it can be pre-curved. So, so you don't have to use solid uh, flat panels that uh, go segmented as you turn the curvature. So this is a very uh, nice uh, facade cladding that is seamless. Like here, the Penang Swing Club is done that way, right? So you can see it's curved, and here is curved and tapered, right? So you can achieve any uh, design in, uh, in 3D or in whatever shapes for your facade cladding. So this is a clubhouse uh, in Kota Kumuning done using a standing seam. So you can also <clears throat> do an interesting trick to the design by varying the panel width, like in this project, right? You can see they use a wider and narrower panel. Like here, close up. Okay, you can play with the panel width. And here again, you can see. So you can either have it as a standard weave or different panel weave. This is uh, Alamanda in Malaysia, Putrajaya. Roof in standing seam. I will double out standing seam and uh, cladding as well. So we can see uh, a very uh, seamless flow in the, from the roof down to the cladding. Uh, this is again another standing seam and the oblique uh, orientation. And uh, another one, you can see the standing seam can uh, wrap around this curved edge. <clears throat> so that, that is the big plus point of the standing seam uh, for sub cladding. Another one, right? Horizontal and vertical, depending on which plane of the building. And back home in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia here, we have the link. This is our snap weld standing seam, not quite the double weld. But nevertheless, uh, it's used for roof as well as for the wall cladding. So this is again a departure from the conventional uh, ACP panel for the wall cladding. And you can have a, a synergy in your design matching from roof down. So another option is the interlocking uh, panel uh, profile. So this is a tongue and groove uh, interlocking panel, uh, silicon free joints. It's very easy to install and uh, very fast as well. So this is again uh, how you can mount the system. It's very straightforward. All you need to do is a subframe and then you can just uh, secure this interlocking panel on the subframe. So this is an example of a project. It's quite similar to standing seat because it's a panel, except that this panel, uh, once installed, is give you a flat surface. Whereas the standing seam will, you have the rip effects, right? The rip will uh, protrude out and it becomes a different uh, statics to your cladding. So again, you can see here, right? What you can see here, the images, you can also be a standing seam, but here is uh, interlocking because it's flat. 
Likewise here, the interlocking panel can be installed horizontally or vertically, and the panel width again can be varied, just like the standing seam. Back home in Malaysia, D7 Commercial Center in Central. This is a color bond material in our Shisma cassette cladding. So that is again an interlocking panel installed uh, horizontally. So a close up look of the uh, interlocking panel. And this is another one installed vertically. Another one, industrial uh, building uh, installed vertically. And you can see here is uh, one piece without joint, 16 meter. Of course, it's uh, quite challenging to install this uh, without any lap. It can be lap or can have a break, but the, the owner and the architects chose to have no laps. So, so that is how versatile the interlocking panel can be. So um, having shared those different systems, maybe you want to have an idea what's the budget like. This ballpark figure, this will give you a ballpark feel. Uh, example, uh, uh, the four millimeters ACP, the fire rated one. Today, we don't talk about non-fire rated uh, core anymore because Bombay is not going to accept it, right? Any building, um, Rugby, Bomba also have directive to say that the existing building that is posing a fire hazard will has to be replaced or removed. So those uh, existing high rise that uses those flammable stuff like the polyfoam, EPS or whatever, be prepared because uh, the cladding is unsafe. And uh, rightly, Bomba will come uh, at the right time to ask you to address this issue. So even for ACP, the non-fire rated, those days below 17, 18 meter can be non-fire rated only above. But today I believe uh, nobody is going to use non-fire rated uh, for safety. So here a ballpark figure, all right? Uh, I would take it as 400 to 700 ringgit per meter square, including subframe to have uh, ACP for sub cladding done on. Then because all these uh, facade cladding under A414 has to be tested if you are more than 18 meter high. So all these uh, panel tested uh, with fire stops. They, they can pass, but they need a lot of fire stops. Uh, we have the fire stop on the first test. Uh, just to share, the next two tests we did, we didn't incorporate any fire stop at all and it passed. So the first test was a little bit scary because you don't know what to expect and being the first in the test, uh, so we kind of play safe. But thereafter, the confidence level came and uh, the fire stop was uh, done away because uh, the owner side, the property developer was uh, SP Satir, Landis Joint Venture. And you know, Landis is a very established uh, developer engineering company in Australia. They have also their own uh, engineering people to assess and uh, simulate the, the test. So here I'm talking about additional cost, right? Depending on to what extent you need to add on the fire stop or the fire break to pass the test. And that uh, fire break or fire stop that you included in the test will have to be installed at the physical site. So this is an add-on cost. And uh, it's, I, I guess it's between 100 to 200 or maybe more. So you have to add this to this as your total cost. And for trapezoidal or corrugated cladding in coated steel, right? I use coated steel because if you use aluminum, then it's a different story because the melting point of aluminum is 650 degrees Celsius. And uh, chances is the cladding uh, on the lower portion would have disappeared or melted away. But in steel, the melting point is 1005. So uh, like you see from the test, is unscathed is uh, uh, pretty uh, good for the uh, test. So here, a uh, ballpark figure, 150 to 200, or even more, if the, depending on the design. And if you use a standing seam uh, profile, uh, then you're looking at maybe this 3 to 350. And if you're looking at interlocking panels, it'd be 250 to 350. Uh, if you use the dark metal tiles, you'll be maybe uh, 350 to 500 K dark metal tiles because it's labor intensive. 
uh, is uh, more expensive. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. I'll just summarize what I presented. So here is uh, point number one, the 0.42 mm BST Swiss mass Sanko speed deck color bond cladding past BS8414 part one without fire stop. And part two, the one I shared with fire stop based on the Satya City Mall cladding system. Point number two, uh, moving forward, regardless of whether the cladding material pass BS476 part four, which is uh, incombustible as defined, or pass part six and seven to be classified as class O, the cladding above 18 meter has to be tested under BS8414. So it is now a full scale system test instead of a material test based on class O. Of course, below 18 meter is still based on a class O uh, consideration by Bomba. And um, the test report in the BS8414 will include the details specification of the cladding system tested and the completed test will need to be repeated if the following specification is changed. Example, if you have an insulated uh, system, if the insulation thickness or the density changes, you have to do a retest. If the cavity depth changes, you have to do a retest. Or if you have fire breaks, uh, at certain uh, position initially, but now you shift that locations or you, you remove some of this, you have to do a retest. So that's how we understand BS8414. So third point is be mindful of legal implication, which I highlighted in the lacrosse fire in uh, Australia. So avoid unsuitable cladding system that cannot meet BS8414. A uh, precedent case already set in Victoria, Australia, a tribunal case where the architect, engineers, and the relevant parties are made compensate for the loss arising from the fire incident. So uh, if the case uh, is uh, uh, such in Australia, in Commonwealth, in Malaysia, I believe it will apply when the incident happened here. And uh, point number four, is coated steel is a solution as a facade cladding, incorporating innovative and versatile system such as Swiss mass Sanko speed deck or standing seam or interlocking panel, or the uh, metal tiles with or without fire stops or fire barrier. So that's the end of my uh, presentation this morning. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, we come to this now Q and A sessions. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Lau and uh, Ms. Wang for your informative presentation on fire safety for building facade. I think as architect, I think we should really careful and take into consideration in designing building facade for the safety of building and the public. And I believe uh, Swissma and Bluescope can always provide us a very good consultation on it. And I I think I do not waste the time. Now we start the, our Q&A session. Okay, uh, whoever has any question to our speaker, there is a raise hand button at the middle of below the screen. So you can just press it and then we'll call you up and you can unmute yourself to raise the question. So anyone actually, uh, or, or actually you can just drop it in the chat box, chat box so our speaker will answer to it as well. Um, any question from the floor? Okay, um, if there's no any question yet, I think I'll take this opportunity to ask a few questions refer to this uh, presentation. Oh, okay, sorry. There is one question from the participant. So, is BS8414 applicable to a fully credited tax level podium car park in a RACI or commercial building? So, I think, yeah, for this question, I think I can uh, uh, answer it. So, for this question, it's about the sixth level uh, podium car park, right? Um, is 
because the BSF 114 requirements is specified to the height of the building, which is 18 meter height. If for this six level, it is exceeded or it is uh, at the right 18 meter height and above, then it should require to conduct the BSF for tax for the external credit system. Regardless, it's for residential or commercial. I mean, even though for car park, for them as well, also actually is applicable, is it? Yeah, so long the building height is more than or, or at 18 meters and above. Yeah, and that means it, regardless of any kind of building, it will be applicable if the building yeah. over 18 meters high. Okay. okay, so if is there any other uh, question to our speaker? Okay, uh, I think I will take this opportunity to ask a question also. Um, oh, okay, sorry, there's another question. So you have shared the part six and part seven is tested the sample surface and part four is actually inside the core of sample. Is there any reason why not adopting part four to reduce fire safety risk, but instead, instead of adopting the full skill test BS? From Jack Chong. So for these okay. questions, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I, I would say yes, uh, part four is, is also uh, tested uh, the internal core of the sample itself. However, the test criteria for part four is only the uh, the temperature rise, which is cannot exceed 50 degrees Celsius, as well as a visible flame. It's, it's not including those uh, mechanical failures or disciplining that risk which are uh, under the BFF 414, uh, the, uh, the fourth and also the fifth criteria, which they are evaluating the mechanical failure of the external credit system, which is more uh, uh, comprehensive or more holistic kind of the uh, fire test to test the overall system for the full external credit system. Because there is some limitations as well like for the part four, whereby it doesn't really include it for uh, or take into the consideration of the mechanical values and also the burning debris. Yeah, yeah I'd like to just expand a bit on the points that Shopping has uh, explained. I think uh, basically 8414 is a system test, it's not a material test. So when you do a system test, there's a cavity, right? So okay. as we all know, and uh, Shopping has shared in the, the presentation pack, how fires can be carried through the cavity, right? So that's why Bomba is very interested to know what's cavity depth. So if you have done a test with this uh, 200 mm uh, cavity and you've got another one with 300, they want you to do a test again for the 300, even you pass the 300. Okay. Uh, okay, is it the answer? Uh, I mean, is the answer... Okay, for you get the answer, uh, Jack Chum. Okay, I think uh, there is a further question from KF. So it's asking about what about partial car park volume, uh, 18 meter height. I think it's supposed to be more than 18 meter height. Passat cladding such as DRFC fins and perforated aluminum panels. I think yeah. this is also uh, Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Hmm. You say it's a uh, facade cladding such as GRFC, it is uh, the fiber reinforced uh, fins, right? So, and uh, perforated aluminum panels. Hmm. So, the BSA 14 uh, spells out that any non load bearing external cladding, that's, that's a description, that's a requirement. So if this falls under the description of a non load bearing external cladding, then rightly it has to be subject to the test. Huh? So whether you, as to your fin, if you're just having a fin instead of a facade cladding, whether is that considered a, a external cladding? Honestly, I don't have the answers. You need to consult with uh, Bomba. Uh, might be exempted. But if you use anything like... Uh, uh, reinforced fiber kind of uh, material. My advice is uh, it 
is uh, you got to really <coughs> consult Bomba because from my understanding, Bomba do not want to um, accept anything flammable inside. Just like the incident happened right in the uh, KWSP building, right? So it's a static skin, but it's actually a polyfoam, you know, or, or polystyrene or whatever that, that makes up the shape of the cladding, oh. right? It's very lightweight. But because the stuff is combustible, even a uh, welding spark can uh, initiate the fire. So from my understanding for Bomba now, for even for factories or any building, if you want to use something combustible as a cladding, uh, Bomba will not uh, favor that or will reject that. So uh, that is better to consult Bomba for fins, uh, whether it falls into this 8414. Sorry, uh, can I maybe maybe I further clarify? Because the BS X four one four is actually is a testing for the system. So is it for external wall cladding system? So is it uh, they mean the external lures, external shading device, external fins, perforated aluminum panel? All these actually considered in the system or actually is excluded in the, from the system? Uh, that's a that's a question that I don't have the answer rightly. Okay. So whether those are deemed external non load bearing cladding, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a thin uh, cladding or it's a perforated. I think perforated aluminum panels is a cladding. Okay, that one is, is quite quite certain. Uh. But if you have a thin and lures with openings all over the place, uh, whether those are considered external cladding, uh, that one, I think you need to uh, consult Bomba. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think there's a further question from uh, Zach Cham. Could you share what is the average testing cost of BS476 R4, R6, R7, and the BS414? Shopley, you want to take that question? Yeah, sure. So uh, the average cost that I have is actually uh, is a, uh, uh, it's about 2K, means 2000 for part four. And then uh, for Park 6, it's about 1.6K. And then for Park 7, it's about 2.2K. But however, for the first applicant, I do believe the cost will be uh, slightly higher compared to uh, the, the estimated uh, figures that I have on my hand now. Because uh, those figures is actually like uh, we are repeating the test, meaning we are renewing the cert, and then we are going to reconduct the test again. However, for those uh, first applicants, you definitely would require to pay more for the registration and etc. for others' uh, administration fees. So the total sum up for these three uh, parts, four, six, and seven, would be roughly uh, 3.8 uh, K. Yeah, for the cost for the BNF 414, I think uh, Mr. Lau can share more about the estimated uh, cost, the order ranging of cost. Okay, thanks, Shaolin. So uh, the BSA 414, uh, the cost consists of two parts. First is the uh, fees, uh, the ceiling fees that you have to pay. And that fees is, uh, remember, it was 40, 45,000, right? Uh, then on top of that, you've got the budget for the cost of doing the actual assembly at the test rig, you know? So you have to get the actual structure in. You've got to get contractors to fix it. And uh, you've got to use the actual cladding materials installed and uh, whatever fire stop, if you have some, everything have to be procured and installed by contractor. And thereafter, again, you have to remove it from test rig. So all these are costs. A ballpark figure, depending on what your material cost uh, comes up to, uh, the fees plus everything else, I would say, ranges 60 to 100,000. That's a ballpark figure. Okay, uh, thanks for your answer. Uh, are there any further questions from the floor? Oh, okay, actually, can I, I have a question also further to this. So, uh, for the BSX414 full-scale test, so is it, I mean, we need it for every building more than 18 meters, I mean, if there's a, I think, a different cladding system. Yeah, that's, that's how... Uh, the re new requirement is uh, they, they are just saying that anything more than 18 meters uh, facade cladding need to have the product or the system uh, 
tested to pass E414. So the big question is whether your test done uh, for project A, right, and you apply to project B similar, would that be uh, deemed or considered passed? Uh, technically, yes, but again, my advice is because it's uh, to get the green light from Bomba, right? Uh, 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 early at the early stage. The reason is uh, uh, don't be caught at the last minute uh, when you do your CCC submitting your forms. Then only Bomba say where is your test. Then you say I have this for another project and uh, this will be the equivalent. Whether that is acceptable or not. I dare not say yes. La. So since you have rightly, they can consider that and accept, but need to go to Bomba for that uh, acceptance. Uh, that's my advice, you know, to avoid any last minute glitches in your CCC. Okay, understand. Okay, thanks for your advice. Okay. Uh, there is further question from Jack Chum. Is Firestock a must for the steel cladding system for SCP to pass BS F414? Yeah, for for I can safely say that for the coated steel cladding, uh, we have already done that, We've done three tests, and from observations and uh, the results, you can safely say that you don't need the Firestock to pass the test. Huh? Whereas the ACP, uh, from what I know and what I uh, hear there is a requirement for the fire stock to be in there. Is to what extent you have your fire stock incorporated vertically, horizontally, whatever spacing. So that one is uh, depending on the manufacturers of those panels, uh, how they want to design the system. Okay, uh, thanks for your answer. There is a question from uh, Anandin Raman Naidu, okay, the testing pass certificate, is it required renew every year? I think. Okay, this, this is a very interesting uh, question. Um, I don't have a real answer, but the fact is that it's unlike those days where it's a class O certification, right? Going in the past, the class O certification uh, yearly renewal, or now they extend every bi uh, biannual renewal. Uh, that is about renewal of a product certification. But today, A414 is a system test. It's not a product certification. So if your product is applied in that system and it passed, whether uh, that pass system, like I said earlier, can be uh, submitted as uh, evidence to show Bomba that the system already tested and passed, hence exempted from BSA414 test in this project. So whether there's a timeline to say that this project, if let's say assuming yes, uh, is there a timeline? I would like to maybe frame it in this way. If yes, is there a timeline like say, hey, this inference of test results can only be valid within one year. Okay, come next year, uh, you lagi. Okay, you've got to do another round. Uh, that one, I really don't. Or maybe there's no timeline because uh, technically there should not be a timeline. So, uh, Unfortunately, uh, Sanan don't have the answer for that. Uh, I think it's still uh, quite new in the market. These questions will be best directed to Bomba. We, we, will, we will seek clarification as a system provider. Uh, good questions. Uh, we will take that question up and uh, uh, inquire from Bomba. If you have any answer, Mr. Sanan, we will uh, communicate with you on that. Okay, there's a further question from KF. Could I apply the same BS F414 test report for project A to B that has similar credit design system as still? I think this one uh, similar to previous question. Is it? Yeah, I think uh, previously Ms. Lau already answered a similar question. So it's, there's no, no, an no, above, no answer from him yet, I think. Have to be referred to Bomba. Okay, is there any question from the floor? I think okay. I think there's a, 
uh, still a lot of open question for this uh, certificate issue. I think uh, Pam Northern Chapter may actually take this uh, find a uh, further study that uh, with uh, and others OMA specialist or others a uh, consultant or fire specialist that actually how actually will it I mean the certificate uh, validity on regarding the test. We will try to find out more. Then we may Pam or each other may actually uh, inform the, to the participant in further. Okay. So any others question? I just just one thing to share because hmm. there's only one lab, one test rig in Malaysia uh, by Sirin in Brasa Para. So can you imagine that uh, the, there's a queue lah? Uh, whether how long is the queue, we don't know because they're so the whole nation is uh, doing the test in the same test rig. So that's why my earlier advice to get the green light from Bomba for like the question posed by PF whether the project A test results. Uh, can be deemed uh, uh, accepted in project B, everything being the same, you know. Uh, that one uh, technically should be, but whether you want to have a, a confirmed answer, uh, my advice is go to Bomba because by the time uh, Bomba says no to whatever reasons a test, then they say you need a test, your project is completed and you want to go to test, you've got to start joining the queue from the back I don't know how many months, and then you're going to impact your CCC. That that was my point. Okay, I think if we uh, do not have any further questions from the floor, I think we may end this session now. Thank you everyone attending to this webinar today. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Mr. B. And thank you everyone for your time. If any questions, I uh, can always uh, post a question to us directly as well. Hope you get our contacts. If not, you go through uh, Pam Norden. Uh, so feel free to uh, ask your questions uh, maybe after the session as well. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you guys in, uh, in person in the near future. Yeah. <laughs>